Hi everyone, my name is Živa Kleindienst and together with Tadej Vindiš, Aleksandra Kostić and Peter Tomáš Dobrila, I am one of the curators of the International Festival of Art, Technology and Science, Kiblix 2021, entitled Virtual Worlds Now. I welcome you on behalf of Kibla, who has been organizing this festival since 2002. In line with Kibla's new long-term research focus on XR technologies and art, in scope of RUC Network of Art and Cultural Research Centers, and considering that the past year has probably been the most virtual year we have lived so far, the key question we are asking for this year's edition is what are the virtual worlds now? Today we continue with the 10th discussion in the series of thematically focused panels in which we bring together international professionals in the fields of XR and other emerging technologies, as well as art. Today's panel will focus on the crossovers between of neuroscience and art and mind control. With great pleasure, I introduce today's moderator, media artist and professor at the UCLA Department of Design and Media Art, Victoria Vesna, and our guest speakers, Masha Yazbets, head of the DDT lab in Terbolia, Cristina Albo, assistant professor of contemporary art history and theory at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, neuroscientist and assistant professor at the University of Puget Sound, Siddharth Ramakrishnan, artist, performer, composer, and scholar, Marco Donnarumma, and Rea Klanschek, who is a project manager at Black Bee Applied Neurosciences. Without further ado, Victoria, the floor is yours. Thank you and hello, hello to everybody. Uh, I'm very excited to share this session. This has been a bit of an obsession of mine ever since I had a dream as a child that somebody was reading my dreams. It was a dream within a dream and I was paranoid about somebody getting into my secrets. God knows what the secrets were when I was seven. Uh, but it kept going and where it really truly took a turn for me personally is when I had the pleasure on, honor to work with uh, uh, Stephen Hawking, whose machine I actually still have. So this is his very, very first um, machine where he would talk through it. And uh, when it got upgraded, so you can look at it here a little bit. When it got upgraded, um, I was given the machine. <laughs> but the reason I think it's so fantastic is because you can see how the technology has progressed where even at that point with one, all he could operate was one finger and yet he would project his thoughts. And that never would have been possible, uh, technologically speaking, uh, until now. And, and this is, we're talking about the 90s, so we already know about brain implants and all the different uh, things that are happening with uh, control, mind control, and also the rising uh, interest uh, on mindfulness in the West, which also is a form of mind control. So to really look at this from many different angles is just super exciting to me. And the way it's going to uh, go is a very short intro of every speaker, and then every speaker will speak also for just five to seven minutes, just for the audience to get a sense who's talking what point of view. And we'll start with Christina Albu, who will give us an art historical point of view. Um, and then we'll go through the list and just ad address many different angles. So we have Masha Yazbet, who is in Ljubljana, and we work together in Japan at the Empowerment Informatics Program. She and robots talk and this is her thing. <laughs> so I always invite her to bring in the other consciousness and talk about how we embed consciousness into technology and robotics in particular. 
Uh, and then we have uh, my longtime collaborator, Siddharth Ramakrishnan, who's uh, a neuroscientist, but just incredibly wild, wonderful mind that I've been so happy to work with. Uh, and together we've explored many things dealing with the mind. We still do. Most recently doing online meditations together. Uh, that Christina Albu has joined quite a few times, actually, because she's so interested into how neuroscience and art intersect and how artists are using these tools. I love her work so much that I, I gave her up one of my octopus crowns. So she, can, she can write with the crown. <laughs> and and then, then some new people for me, which I'm really excited to hear from, is uh, uh, Rhea. Uh, so Rhea Klanschek is coming to us from Slovenia, and she's coming in from an angle of neuromarketing, which is a really interesting thing to be quite in the open about it and not get all, like it's always negative necessarily, but also to have a dialogue with people who actually do the neuromarketing, I think is really important. Uh, and then Marco Donnarumma, who uh, is coming to us from Berlin and who looks at the body. And uh, uh, this is, of course, to me, so interesting to think about the complete intelligence as opposed to just in the brain. Uh, and then naturally and beautifully, Warren Needy came to us last minute. That's why he wasn't in the introduction that Jiva gave, that was pre-recorded. Um, but last minute he came and last minute I was like, yes, yes, yes. It really rounds it up so beautifully because he literally started as a neuroscientist, then became an artist and then is meshing it together and looking at it from kind of cognitive capitalism and incredibly eloquent theorists. So it's just wonderful to have you, Warren, and hear your voice. So with that, I will just uh, turn it over to Christina, who is an assistant professor of contemporary history and theory at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. And she's doing some pretty cool research on this subject. So she'll give us a little bit of an overview and then we'll continue from there. Welcome, Christina. Thank you very much, Victoria, for the introduction. Uh, I wish I had worn my, my top <laughs> headdress <laughs> to be more plural <laughs> and more aware of, of my body and my mind as I give this presentation. Let's try and open my, my PowerPoint. Uh, I don't see it now, so please bear with me a second. We're also going to think about how our group and collective relationships are changing through these kind of events and how we deal with latency and spaces. How much do our brains actually, how far out do we go? So just in this example, we have Slovenia, Los Angeles, Berlin. It's, it's pretty amazing how this impacts us. All right, so I filled in the space for you. Thank you, I think I've got it now. <laughs> So um, I'm going to briefly tell you about uh, how I became interested in neuroscience. I was working on a project focused on a genealogy of artworks, which entailed reflective surfaces um, and more trigger feedback between the viewer's movements, let's say, and um, a series of sounds or images. And I was realizing that the, the participants in such projects feel empathetically connected to each other, and sometimes they emulate um, each other's gestures. They observe each other as they are acting um, as a group. And they are usually familiar strangers. They are not people that, that know each other, yet share this effective alliance for a very short period of time. So as I was presenting on this project at various conferences, um, someone in the audience asked me, like, do you know about mirror neurons? Because I feel, you know, like that explanation that comes from neuroscience totally makes sense in terms of the processes you are describing uh, concerning this um, alliances between viewers. Um, and that kind of opened, you know, a new territory for me. And I realized this is uh, one way in which we could um, explain the way in which people feel connected to each other um, 
at a distance sometimes just through processes of the observation. So at the moment I'm working on a group project called Embodied Signals, Affect, Intimacy, and Communication in Biofeedback Art. And it maps out the trajectories of art practices which use EEG technology. Uh, so I'm going to give you a very brief um, overview of a couple of examples of such work to familiarize you with the roots um, of such projects. Um, and then I'm going to briefly talk about um, the, the concept of, of control and how it relates to this work. Um, so the first work um, that entails the use of EEG um, comes from Alvin Lucia, who is a musical composer, um, and he became very interested in alpha brainwaves, which we produce when we enter a meditative state. Um, they are low-frequency brainwaves. Uh, and he started to experiment and see how he could modulate sound with his uh, mind. Um, and he created a script um, um, for, uh, for this performance. And he was very afraid of performing it live because it's the kind of process that is, is very unpredictable in quality. Um, so he's wearing electrodes, uh, measuring his um, brain frequency. And um, then the signals are amplified, and uh, he could um, activate sounds, percussive sounds that were produced by various instruments. And he found it really hard to control this whole process. Uh, he would regulate his breathing and close his eyes in order to enhance the ability to produce his brainwaves and produce sounds. But initially, he was very afraid, anxious of performing it live precisely because of the elusive quality of the interaction. Um, another work is by David Rosenboom. He's also a musical composer, and he's been working with neurofeedback for a very long period of time. Um, so in the 1970s, he started experimenting with the use of EEG technology and sound. And I th think it's not at all accidental that we see so many people from, from the musical field who we're starting to use this technology initially um, because these brainwaves, alpha brainwaves that we are so interested in because they, they are so important for our well-being um, are the sometimes produced when, when people close their eyes. So many of them were, were using sounds and correlating them uh, with, um, uh, with this brainwave frequency. Um, however, there are also artists who were starting to use imagery and David Rosen is combining uh, sound and images in this particular case. This is called the Vancouver piece. It's an installation that he created in 1973. So uh, two people would enter this insulated, acoustically insulated room, which is fairly dark, except for the moment when um, they would have electrodes attached to their heads and whenever they would be producing um, alpha brainwaves, there would be a spotlight um, that would be switched on above their heads. One of them was red, one of them was, was green to differentiate between them. And the two participants were separated by this aluminized uh, mylar screen. Um, so when the light came on, they could see themselves in this reflective surface and see each other as they were both producing alpha brainwaves simultaneously entering this relaxed state of mind, uh, their images would be superimposed on this reflective surface. Another um, landmark of biofeedback art is a work by Nina Sobel called Brainwave Drawings, and she's been developing this project from the 1970, uh, 1972 to the present. It's a participatory installation in which two participants um, are entering something, some, some um, scenario like this where um, it, it looks like, like a living room, like this domestic setting in which people would, would feel comfortable and they would be watching television together. But what they see on the monitor here is images of themselves um, as well as this um, graph that is oscillating. There are two axes that correspond to each participant, one horizontal and one vertical. And they are wiggling constantly in relation to their uh, brainwave frequency. And as they manage to enter a state of attunement with each other and produce alpha brainwaves, uh, there's the potential for these lines, wiggly lines, to form a full circle suggestive of their oneness. What I find truly astounding about uh, Nina Sobel's um, uh, uh, 
practice is the fact that she was also interested in allowing the viewers to have agency over the images so they could actually switch off um, the um, um, switch on the, the video and watch themselves um, turn turn back, reverse, and uh, watch their interaction previously um, on the monitor screen through through the use of video feedback. Uh, so it was not only about the live observation, but also about this observation of what has previously happened and how they managed to get in tune with each other. So a few words, just briefly, uh, also about recent artworks. I have here also Victoria Vesna and Marcus Kunz. Up top is brainstorming. She can talk more about this, this project. She's, she's, she's the originator of it. But I, I find that with contemporary artworks, there's more and more an interest in raising questions about communication um, with other species, raising questions about the unpredictability of this process is uh, the way we can stay open to what is happening within us as well as outside our bodies and become more in tune with each other. Um, I won't talk about this project, so I'm just highlighting them since time is really short. But I want to get to the concept of control since it constitutes the, the basis of our discussion today. And the roots of the word go back to medieval um, Latin, and um, it used to mean uh, to verify, to check against. Uh, so it's an accounting term. I think Warren may find this interesting. He's going to talk about cognitive capitalism in a little bit. So it was used um, to reference this uh, duplicate register that would be created in accounting to, to check um, the, the payments that are being made. And it's only later on in the, six, in the 16th um, century that the term also acquires this meaning of regulating action, maintaining authority over something. Um, so here are some of the way in which I see the term correlating with this biofeedback project. Um, in all of them, there is a strong focus on the ability of the participant to maintain attention and to turn it both inward and outward to become aware of the correlations that exist between um, his or her brainwave frequency and sounds or images that oscillate in relation to the brain signal. Another uh, important aspect has to do with the ability to shape the communicative exchange, since many of this work I was imagining have a social dimension and entail this pairing between one participant and multiple others, um, or one other, uh, in this um, intimate setting, there's a strong focus on remaining open, um, maintaining control over one's ability to communicate with the other person and create an exchange. Uh, because very often what happens is only when synchronicity in your frequency is attained that uh, one can alter the environment, um, the visual or auditive signals. Um, another element of control has to do with the ability to anticipate and influence the outcome. Um, so some of the participants may, may want um, to focus on this task that is given to them, on this idea that they need to attain that achievement. But often what happens in this work is that the more they focus on the idea of a goal, the less they are able to actually enter that alpha brainwave state that permits them to um, reach attunement with the other person. So there's this push and pull between one's desire to control and the need to let go, to allow for that communication to occur in a fluid manner. And last and not least, I think, you know, control in this case, it has to do with the ability one has to calibrate the degree of autonomy in relation to the constant variables, the changing circumstances. Very often, many of this work also entail a public audience. Um, so there's, there's a matter of um, becoming aware not only of the communication with um, the person one is paired with while um, the newer frequency is, um, is measured, but also an awareness of the social circumstances um, that, that one is part of in this process. And I think, you know, the, the fact that one has an audience while performing uh, attunement is, is an important factor to account for. So these are two questions that are, are driving, you know, my, my interest in um, notions of control within the framework of this um, artwork focused on biofeedback. So 
So one of them is how is mental control to be redefined in view of neuroscientific findings about the limits of free will? How do we come to terms with the fact that our agency is actually limited and um, that we constantly need to, to modulate and to ponder our ability to, um, to express our options and um, also face the, the constraints at the same time? How do we not lose hope and, and give up in, entirely once, once realizing that we lack this free will? How do we need to redefine what control is, basically? Because I think we, we have problems with that, with that notion of, of control and focusing on it only from this perspective of, of the individual, um, which, which is um, a very fallacious way of, of thinking about this. So my second question focuses on how are human-centered notions of control to be reshaped to account for the agency of technology and non-human entities? Um, how do you think of control in relation to this broader system, social, political, um, biological systems that we are all part of? Um, how am I doing with time? I, I think I'm, I'm done, right? I I'm, think I'm, so, I'm, but yes, the, the two... The, the two questions that you pose are just so critical and uh, especially to me the interspecies and non-human communication that really expands that industrial way of thinking of control. It's really a great foundation. Thank you. So you can also pull in things later when we Yeah, know. I'm sure. I just had one more extra slide, but I, I'm sure we're going to address us. those questions show, later on. Show us, show us the oh, extra slide. Fine. Go, go. go. Fine. No, no, no. It's a lot of text on it. So I, I'll leave those questions you, for later. You'll on. use it. Okay, great. All right. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. So we move... Uh, if you could stop your sharing, uh, we're going to move now to Masha Jasbets, who's coming to us from Slovenia. She uh, got her PhD from the Empowerment Informatics Program uh, in Tsukuba, Japan, where we also worked together for a while. And uh, now she's uh, in a startup in Trebovne. Uh, she's head of the DDT lab, uh, and they're doing some pretty cool stuff. So we're going to hear <laughs> about what they're doing and how it is thought through. Welcome, Masha. Always good to see you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And Victoria, thank you for such a nice introduction. It's my great, great pleasure to be part of uh, this session with such an amazing panelist. I'm really looking forward for all the presentations and discussions. Yes, uh, currently I'm leading uh, DDT Laboratory. It's a laboratory, it's a platform where we are uh, producing um, projects that are on the crossroads with art, science, technology. And our mission is also we are for the democratization of science and um, uh, artistic projects and also new technologies, because we think if these um, developments are here out. So I think everyone should have the, the chance and the right to, to be introduced with it because it's for the people, right? And I don't like that all this um, research and an amazing um, advances stay only in these academic circles. Mm. Okay, and let's just start a little bit about my journey, how I actually started to be interested in neuroscience and brain-computer interfaces technologies. It all started during my studies in, in Japan at the Powerment Informatics. Um, I went to study there um, to Japan because of my such interest in Android science in robotics. And of course, where else to go than to Japan? And I did my uh, research internship at uh, ATR at Professor Hiroshi Shiguro Laboratory. Uh, for those who don't know, Professor Hiroshi Shiguro is the pioneer of Android science. He's making um, robots that really looks like human, like they come out from Blade Runner movie. And, and there I had the pleasure uh, to work with uh, also with neuroscientists and we did an experiment and they actually they accepted my proposal, my research proposal, and we did a body swap with an Android robot. 
So uh, we did we tested body ownership illusion with an Android mo robot that actually was moving, and I was quite surprised uh, that with this protocol that is needed to achieve it, we did it this in like three minutes, and we tested this with the people who came out um, outside of the laboratory. They were not familiar with the experiment, and 90% of the people. Um, in this experiment, they felt the body of an android, like you can see on the first picture, like if there's their own. So this is where we were researching brain plasticity and body ownership um, illusions. And then at the same time, they were also running an experiment because android science is also for the rehabilitation. So you could get, you can interact with the Android robot with your brain waves only. So you, you can control the head, the, the, the whole body actually. So I was part of this experiment. Um, they also were working on the experiment where you can control the third robotic arm while you are doing multitasking. For example, you are typing and you are thirsty and with your brain waves you can call the third hand and to give you a drink. This actually worked. I, I was able to test it and there is also a science paper outside. And um, and I'm not coming from uh, neuroscience and of course I needed some support to understand some facts about it. And there I met in Japan a very nice scientist, Dr. Mariam Alimardani, and she introduced me to neuroscience and really impressed me by it. And then from the artistic point of view is uh, Victoria Vesna project, uh, Octopus Brainstorming amazing project uh, and re really amazing collaboration with artists and neuroscientists uh, which we had a pleasure also to experience it in Slovenia at Speculum Artium Festival and and then after I came um, from Japan I was invited to teach uh, the master program interface culture where I had the opportunity in Linz to meet with uh, Erika Mondria, and she is an artist uh, also researching neuroscience. She actually established a brain lab at Ars Electronica Festival. And all this kind of led it that I wanted to continue with the, with the neuroscience or more to say with the brain computer interface technologies or neuro neuroscience technologies. So in our laboratory, we established also a laboratory, a part of our laboratory it's for the brain computer interface um, applications uh, research. And also we are developing prototypes and we demonstrate that we organize workshops. So we do like neuro robotics, neuro art and neuro VR. Here on the picture, you can see this big painting in the middle is actually there a performer, um, our member, and he is painting a, pic, a painting on the on the, this digital canvas. This was on the opening on a very important conference of so future and um, oh, the future of industry and internalization organized by the Ministry of Economic Development and Technology in in Slovenia. And um, here in Slovenia, I don't have androids, but we have like small uh, humanoid robot. Uh, now we call her Eva. And we also developed an application that you can actually uh, move her body with your brain waves. And on the right side, you can see the small robotic arm. We also um, developed an application that you can interact with it with your brain waves. In this case, here you can paint, paint with it. And this you can see we also call like creative rehabilitation projects. And there is also big interest um, uh, from the um, from the disabled people who cannot use their 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 arms anymore, you know they are interested in test our uh, prototypes, and we hoped we can do that soon. We were stopped to do that because of the old familiar situation with the COVID, and we co we are collaborating also with the uh, with the companies, and this case is a forum company for aviation. And together with them, we developed um, application that you can 
uh, that you can navigate, that you can control a uh, flying simulator uh, with your brainwaves. For this, we also design like the whole experience, special chair where you can go inside. We put all the technologies, all the equipment on the user, give instructions, and just after five minutes, actually three minutes, the user can fly, can operate the, the flying simulator only with their brainwaves only. And it was my pleasure just like a few days ago to demonstrate uh, this, people, uh, this project uh, in, uh, in Technopark, a science museum, also to the, to the people who cannot walk, but now they were able to fly. Um, and with our project, uh, we are developing a project with, for brain-computer interfaces together with the youth. So all this project that I showed you here were actually de um, developed in collaboration with students from high school and students from university. Um, we give them the opportunity um, to work with such technology or even introduce them such technology because in Slovenia, I don't know how it's elsewhere, but in schools they don't have um, such technology, not even courses that they could learn about these technologies. And this is where we came in and we introduced them and not just introduced them in theory, but in practice. We don't talk much, but we do hands on. So all these projects were done together with students and also we are demonstrating this with students. And um, it's my real pleasure to say that we also um, encourage and inspired some of our youth to continue to study uh, the neuroscience, especially they are interested in this to empower people with, uh, neuro, uh, with neurotechnologies. Um, and um, so especially females as well. And at the same time, we also show uh, to the youth that you can develop such things also in Slovenia, that you don't have to go abroad, that these things are not only in Japan or the United States, but also in Slovenia and also in such a small town such as, such as Terbole. And I'm also happy that in October we will also start collaborating with uh, cognitive science students from University in Ljubljana. They will come to our laboratory to, to, to do the Praxa practicum work and to get introduced in, with hands-on with, with such technologies, not only in theory. So that is um, from me now. And, Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Masha. It's always so inspiring to see how driven you are and how much you put out. And it's been always a pleasure to work with you in Japan. But I was always impressed with the fact that you were saying, we're small, we're Trebovle, but we're going to do something amazing. <laughs> <laughs> on the ashes of the industrial ex-Yugoslavia. It's, it's fascinating to me. All right, so we move on. We go to Berlin, and we're going to hear from Marco Donnarumma, who is an artist, performer, stage director, and he comes to us from the embodied consciousness where he really looks at the body as, as a way of expression from uh, personal to collective. So it's a real pleasure to meet you, Marco, and the floor is yours. Thank you. So my pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. And actually, I have a, a point of connection with Christina because um, a large part of, of my PhD thesis back five, six years ago was about uh, biofeedback in the art and in music in particular. So I've seen things there. Oh. And um, yeah, so okay, maybe I explain where where I come from in respect to the theme of today. And uh, so, as I just mentioned in, in, in my PhD some years ago, um, I specialized in physiological computing for music performance, and uh, that's how I started investigating various biosignals from the body, including the EEG. And um, which is, yeah, brain uh, signal that can be measured with electrodes. And um, so I got my scientific background in, in that context. 
where we were doing human computer interaction work and research into how to enable embodied ways of interacting with media in general and then with a specific application of, of music. So that was my first um, encounter with neuroscience and um, from there I, I went on um, doing other works related to biosignal but not to uh, brain waves because uh, merely because it's very difficult to measure brain waves at least in my experience when moving so being a performance based uh, work the one that I do I always ended up using different biosignals like um, muscle sound or electrical discharges from the muscle that are also measured with electrodes and so on uh, but then I, uh, it was destiny apparently to come back to neuroscience and in particular to neurorobotics uh, with, uh, with a work that I will just show a trailer now and we'll speak over it, describing it a bit. And uh, in 2016, when I was a fellow at the um, University of the Arts in Berlin, I uh, started a collaboration with the Neurorobotic Research Laboratory at Voigt Hochschule. Uh, which is a laboratory for uh, neurorobotics research and um, they have been developing since 15 years about uh, an android robot and uh, the way they study the robot is, is in particular how the robot develop some kind, some form of intelligence by learning through its own embodiment. So the robot literally lives in the labs, moves and watches what's happening around. And thanks to a special framework that is called Behavior Design Environment, BDE, uh, they, they can let the robot learn from others' action, from its own action, from whatever it sees on, uh, uh, in its surroundings. And so basically what I did with the robot that you see in the, in the video is uh, I, just, I just took this platform and then abused it from scratch in order to create a robot which is a prosthesis essentially, which is called Amitala. And um, I did not program the way the robot moves, but I programmed the sensory motor system that allows the robot to move. In other words, the sensory motor system, for those who don't know, it's, it's the basic of all uh, animal life, essentially, uh, including human, because we are animals. And um, it's, it's the basic feedback where we get information through our senses. So I touch my computer now and I understand the computer is hard and I shouldn't hit my head against it, for instance. That's a very trivial, uh, feedback system of uh, sensory motor system. And so I programmed this kind of system in the robot. So the robot um, feels the consistency of its own skins and based on that information and based on how, how fast it's moving in that moment and whether it's interacting with another living thing or not, then it, it adjusts the ways it cuts the skin because the purpose of the robot is to learn how to cut its own skin. Now, obviously, this is not a work about neuroscience, but it's pretty much a work about control. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a particular point of view about control in the sense that it, it is, of course, very critical of, of many different practices. And that's manifested in a body that destroys itself. But it, it doesn't actually destroy itself. And that's, that's what I find very interesting. It actually manages to, uh, to create a um, garment of skin and cuts that have a certain aesthetic. And then, as you can see here, then I actually use the sculpture that the robots created afterward as independent artworks. And um, so this is the work. Now, I don't have too much time to get into the details of it, but um, just to highlight a couple of, um, of points about it. So 
as I said, the interest was in control, but also in how AI is used for uh, controlling categorization of people in society. And um, that's, that's one major point of the work. So the ritual of skip cutting is actually a ritual that is very important to several animistic societies that still exist today, from mm -hmm. Papua New Guinea to Eastern Africa. And, um, and there too, contrary to the romanticization that we do generally in the West, uh, the ritual is a way of, um, the ritual of cutting of the skin is a way of categorizing people. If you don't do it, because of maybe you cannot pay for it, maybe you are unable to do it for other reasons, you cannot then establish your position within society, which can translate to not being able to marry, for instance, or to go hunting. And you know, it's not that different from the increasing and extensive and extenuating use that we are forced to do on social media, giving our data in order to be categorized for various type of action. So here we go back to the issue of control. And um, and I think there is also something else that I just put there out of as um, as a, some kind of point of, of talking maybe for afterwards. I think there is, there is something about the way we reflect about science in the West. It's, uh, it's extremely, extremely closed and, um, and sometimes a bit fictional. I'm not saying that science is fictional, but the way we approach science sometimes, it's uh, so limited to become almost fictional. So just make, to make an example, and then I close it there, but I worked a lot on prosthesis. The amygdala is the work that I show you now. There are several others. And the idea of prosthesis, it, it, the, the prosthesis itself as a concept and as an object, it, it's quite self-explanatory in this sense, because there are about 100 million uh, people in need of prosthesis, according to a study by, by Southampton University and 80% do not have access to prosthesis. 80% of 100 million people. And possibly, I can imagine, I don't know, that wasn't specified in the paper, but possibly the other 20% is in Western countries. So this is not directly related to neuroscience and art, but it's more related to a general, um, general approach to the sciences. Uh, where, for instance, there is a lot of talk these days of amazing prosthesis that can be controlled uh, with the mind and so forth, and, and this is all great. Um, but what I want to point out, that's really just a very small fraction uh, of people that can benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is important. So not what I'm trying to say is not it's not a bad thing that there are these development, but I think we should really be careful about how we consider how those development uh, influence the life of who. That's that's for absolutely me question. Thank absolutely, you. and that's really what we're coming together to discuss and look from many different angles. Of course, from a point of view of privilege in the end. Um, but I, I, I just want to mention an impression I had because your work is new to me, this work that you presented. Um, it's very powerful and it at once reminded me of Herman Nietzsche's work and uh, uh, Deleuze Guattari. <laughs> like, it just went, <laughs> okay, this is a kind of a upgraded contemporary version of these uh, lineage of uh, kind of aesthetics and thinking through and being um, provocative for sure and intense. Um, thank you for that. And it's actually a perfect way to dovetail into Warren's work. Um, so uh, Warren's work actually really complements what you've been talking about a lot. So, Warren, are you ready to give us a little bit of a intro on your thinking? You're, uh, somehow we lost your voice. I must say that um, I was so interested in everyone's talk so far. I mean, um, I must say that I'm kind of in another world, and that's, that's a good thing. I mean, I'm, I, I'm so glad that uh, 
actually that Victoria invited me to this because I learned, I'm learning so much about uh, everybody else's practices and uh, it's um, very in, in, endearing. And uh, I also um, have been hearing, um, you know, the other kind of an, an optical unconscious. I've been hearing a political a desire for um, using technology uh, not as a way of control, but as a way of emancipation. And uh, that is where my work um, really is. That's what I've been uh, trying to focus on uh, for a long time. And, um, and because I heard all of this, I also decided that I wanted to wait maybe to another time where I can send you links to more detailed uh, lectures uh, that I give that, you know, I really can't do within this small amount of time, which I'm wasting by going on and on and on. But I would like to show you maybe some art projects. I don't, I hope I can get this video going. I was trying to find a link and then whatever. We'll see if it, how we can do it. Uh, maybe you can help me. But I'd like, without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, share my PowerPoint with you. And I'm not going to talk that much in detail, uh, you know, about, you know, what I usually talk about, but we'll do it another time. I can see that we're going to have a long relationship, everyone here with me and I with you, and um, uh, through my various venues, schools, exhibitions, and things like that, I think we'll, we'll have opportunities to really uh, talk deeply with each other, maybe with, you know, hearing an hour of everybody's talk rather than six minutes. So without further ado, I'd like to try to um, show you some of my artwork, uh, especially what's going on, because I think it's relevant. Okay, here we go. Let's see if I can do this, okay. I think this is it. Oh, yes. Okay. So Warren just wanted to say we're doing short intros, oh. but the focus of this meeting is really to have a discussion. Okay. Uh, so I, I, you want me to, um, you want me to, uh, I'm Warren Nydick. Uh, I already talked, uh, mentioned to everybody, but uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm an artist and founder of the Sospe Summer Institute of Art, which is on our 10th rendition. We will, we are doing uh, uh, this year, it's dedicated to activist neuroaesthetics. Uh, and uh, what you're hearing a lot from other people is really activist neuroaesthetics. So, I mean, uh, you can kind of get the definition. I mean, if, if, for example, using brain waves to uh, make emancipatory musical composition. And by the way, in your first slide, um, uh, there is a picture of John Cage. John Cage is, is putting on the uh, headset of the artist, by the way, <laughs> which was amazing to me. Okay, so um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce a little bit of what I'm going to do through this idea of cognitive capitalism. And as you can see, I've been engaging with cognitive capitalism really since 2010, but these books, three books that I've done, which are from conferences. The first I did in LA with Arne de Bavor at the Hollywood Library called The Psychopathologies of Cognitive Capitalism, part one. And then it, it, it continued as um, furthermore. So cognitive capitalism is when, and I, I like when I'm in, um, settings of where people are mixed. Some people speak English, some people don't, whatever. And since I'm an English speaker, I like to show the slides and read them because I find that people follow it a lot long, a lot better. So please read along with me. The brain and the mind are the new factories of the 21st century. We are no longer laboring on assembly lines, making objects like automobiles, but rather perform immaterial, effective, and intellectual labor on such social media websites, such as Instagram and Facebook, while all the time creating customized data from our searches on search engines like Google. So, uh, this so-called big data and, re uh, and recently referred to as the big other by Shoshana Zuboff, here is how she describes it, is a ubiquitous networked institutional regime that records, modifies, commodifies everyday experience from toasters to bodies, communication to thought, all with a view to establishing new pathways to monetization and, and profit. Each one of us may 
follow a distinct path, but that path is already shaped by the financial or ideological interests that imbue big other and invade every aspect of one's, one's life. False consciousness is no longer produced by the hidden facts of class and their relationship to production, but rather by the hidden facts of commoditized behavior modification. Early cognitive capitalism heralds a mutation of post Fordism. It is defined by precarious part-time insecure labor, a sleepless multi-time zone 24-7 work schedule, and real subsumption where everything is, becomes work. You're at a party, you're, you're uh, looking at your, eye, your, your phone, and you're uh, you know, liking something on Facebook. That's kind of work. The financialization of capital characterized by her behavior, uh, the stock market is no longer generated um, by uh, the quality of a corporation's work, but by uh, the emotions that are surrounding, um, uh, you know, uh, whether the market is optimistic or not. A shift to the valorization economy uh, in which desire is created in the minds of cognitariates through communicative capitalism in which immaterial labor predominates over uh, material labor. We are no longer proletariats working on assembly lines, we're cognitariats working in front of uh, computer screens. Late cognitive capitalism is, known, is, is also known as the cognitive turn in cognitive capitalism and commences around the turn of the century in a world in which the predominant forms of labor are intellectual and service oriented. The machinery of the brain takes on added importance as a locus of capitalistic adventurism and speculation. The so-called privatization of the neural common by neural capitalism. It consists of three conditions, neural power, hedonism, uh, and the frontalization of the Rostal March. I'm not going to get into that, but here, here is um, my latest work. Um, and I think I'm going to turn on the next one. It should work, I hope. Um, let's see here. No, that's not going to work. Oh, it was working before. It's a movie. Okay, well, I'll just explain this work. So this work is called, uh, and this is to me, um, you know, kind of in, incorporates a lot of the things that I'm talking about or your you know, people were talking about. I'm not talking about brain computer interfaces. The next slide, I hope I can get to the, um, to the, uh, um, to the link uh, will be about brain computer interfaces. But basically uh, this is a work called the Parthenon Marbles Recoded. Uh, the uh, the uh, phantom as other. So basically, this is an artificial neural network. And as you can see, it has a uh, input layer, which is made of the Parthenon marbles, a hidden layer, which is this complex, uh, you know, uh, very deep AI, complex feed forward feedback systems, uh, the, uh, the inter interacting with a series of uh, terminologies uh, that are and linkages and synapses and things like that. And then an output layer, which is the singularity, not singularity, which are fed by artificial intelligences that are being sculpted. Now, the key here, the key here is that if you can look at the bottom, you can see that there are these phantom limbs. What happened with the, with the, with the Parthenon marbles, which, as you know, was, were stolen in 1801 from Athens, from uh, the Acropolis and taken to the uh, British Museum, where they still are in 1801 by Lord Elgin. And uh, there is a big you know, big argument and discussion about returning them. So this becomes on one hand, a kind of um, yeah, an example of, uh, you know, a, a situation of uh, cultural pilferage and uh, reparations, arguments that are occurring. It could have been the Bene, it could be about the Benin uh, bronzes. It could have been about Jewish war uh, uh, artworks that were stolen during the war. It could be about Napoleon's uh, uh, you know, pillage of uh, Alexandria. I mean, it could be anything. I chose this particular example because I felt it was the best example. But anyway, this situation of colonialism and cultural pilgrimage, uh, pillaging, and this whole idea of, of trying to um, change people, uh, it's been going on and it continues to go on. So I was thinking, okay, let's make a work about the future, about what would a digital governance be like in the future, rather than uh, then sculpting uh, the artificial intelligences and the artificial neural networks through the optimization paradigms, what if this whole uh, concept, they were sculpted by the psychic energy coming out of phantom limbs? 
So if you can follow me here, there's a what's called a telescopic telescoped phantom limb, which is coming off the leg of, uh, of this reclined figure, male figure, and that is going up all the way to the, to the top. And this is very dynamic sculpture. For some reason, the, the, the slide after, which was a movie, is not working, but whatever. It's a very dynamic sculpture, and anybody who's in Berlin can come see it. It's, it'll be, it's, oh, we're having another opening on Friday. And um, what's happening is, is that what's, what's, um, what's uh, sculpting uh, and pruning the, the deep layer of the artificial neural network, the hidden layer, all the layers uh, of the stratifications, as Deleuze would say, in the, in, and this is a kind of uh, brain without organs. It's, uh, you know, one could take Deleuze's idea of the body without organs and, and change it into this concept of the brain without organs, and it's constantly evolving. It never, it never stops. And what happens here is that the psychic energy, this all, the, which is a stand-in for uh, minor cultures, it's a stand-in for um, uh, minor histories, it's, it's a stand-in for the other, it's, it's, it's the specters of Marx. It's, it's a stand-in for those kinds of information that are nor not normally being used, at least presently, uh, to create the artificial intel intelligence of today and tomorrow. And we know from in the example of face recognition that some of this technology is racist and recapitulates the uh, structural racism that exists in the patterns that are existing within the cultural milieu. So that uh, we know that happens. So this is an example of trying to, to talk about another way, trying to uh, inc you know, possibly think about another concept. And this is uh, the video. Here, yeah, it's going to work. I think it's going to work. Let's see. Okay, so now you see the video. Want me to do it again? It's very short. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. So you can really see the psychic energy in getting, you know, and, and causing the pruning. Okay, and then let's see if we can even, if we're so lucky, I have one more, one more slide and let's see if I can do this. Let me see if I can, if I can. Um, okay, well, I thought I would be able to, um, hold on for a second, let me just see if I can. Uh, we can uh, we yeah, can well, just share the Vimeo link with the audience uh, okay. in our chat so okay. people can go Here. to it. That's, go to that Vimeo link because that is a 3D rendering of a, ver a, 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 I'll tell you what it's about. I was trying to get an image of it, but um, what happened here is that I developed a, um, a, a, a 3D, here, hold on for one second. Uh, what I've done now, and you, if you go to that link, did everyone get that link or should I go back and put it on again? No, it's fine. We got it. You want to show it? Okay. Did you, could you do it? Yeah? Yes. Okay. So what I, what I, um, what I was going to say is that, um, hold on for one second. Um, that what I'm, what I did, is I have this. Um, I'm, I'm creating a generative artificial intelligence. So, um, which is more than just a connectionist model, because you could argue that first thing, first uh, sculpture, neon sculpture, and why I'm using sculpture, by the way, is just quickly to tell you the two reasons, the most obvious reasons are one, is that. Well, three, three reasons. One, I like using an anachronistic technologies. Two, uh, neon is used, uh, pre, you know, since the early 20s, uh, early 20th century to um, sell things. Uh, part of, you know, of, you know, making big neon signs was to get attention. So it operates within, in the older analog attention economy. But also in my case, it's about um, utilizing it to sell uh, in, in the marketplace of ideas, it's about a kind of it's a, a kind of marketplace of ideas becomes a place where neon, rather than commoditizing and selling commodities or a movie theater or whatever, is about this kind of what what I call wet conceptual art, uh, a, a conceptual project that is colorful and 
engaging and attention grabbing and brings you in and it's carnivalesque and all the ideas of carnivalesque. And the third reason is, is because the same quantum mechanics that occur at the, at, in the gaseous, uh, the excitement of the electron into a higher orbit and then its return, which, which causes the emission of the gas, certain qu quantum uh, mechanical uh, changes are also occurring in the neuron um, in, in, in the microtubule, according to Hameroff. Um, whose work is most explicit about this. There are quantum mechanic uh, changes in the microtubules of the axon, which are really important for memory, and uh, there's research going on to that. So I was trying to connect the, 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 this kind of uh, quantum mechanics of both. But anyway, in the, in the hopefully you can get to that, um, into that uh, uh, link, and then what I'm trying to do is, again, showing the psychic energy generated by the phantom limbs is the dominant input through the input layer, which sculpts the efficiencies of the connections and synapses of the artificial neural network. But in this case, this input is modulated by another source of input from the combined choices made by individuals interacting with the entity. So this, this thing becomes this entity. It becomes, when you, when you enter into the virtual reality uh, immersive immersive field, what you're interacting with is um, a generative uh, a neural network that is actually um, is actually in front of you and you're interacting with it. And as you're and, and with this future, uh, which is already maybe on 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 uh, you can get it already, the VR brain computer headsets with the eye tracking, you're creating data and that data is then feeding into the system and it's changing uh, the various uh, fibrils or the, um, the, the, the stringy like structures. Uh, so some are turning, are getting turning off and some are turning on. So the whole sculpture is changing within the time through the social engagement uh, of the different people wearing the headsets. So the, and so basically the, the, that the organization of the virtual sculpture is constantly changing. The structure is an emerging and generative structure created by the combined psychic data emanating from the subjects interacting and making choices about what to pay attention to and the immersive environment and the psychic energy of the phantoms. In the end, the subjects are on one hand looking at the self-reflexive entity. They are together producing, socially producing, and the artwork makes visible and opaque the usually invisible and transparent quality of mindedness. So anyway, uh -huh. that's what... <laughs> How perfect! How perfect! Oh my God. <laughs> your, your work gives us a lot uh, of food for thought for the discussion later. And if you could just add uh, the Vimeo link to the chat, then oh, everybody okay. can have uh, it. Alrighty. All and right. we will call to the floor Dr. Siddharth Ramakrishnan, a good friend, collaborator, neuroscientist, uh, who's currently working at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma. And uh, he'll talk a little bit about his current work and also his obsession with tarot, I think he'll mention. Okay. So Thank welcome, you. Siddharth. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm Siddharth, and I kind of want to give you a trajectory of my um, pathway here. I started off as a computer scientist, moved into working with snail brains and fish brains, and then I had the chance to work on brain computer interfaces, and then dive deep into the world of art and science. And then over the last few years, I've also been really investigating neuroethics and uh, the kind of touching upon what we're going to talk about today is uh, what is the ethics behind all of this and the mind control and things like that. So where is neuroscience heading? So speaking of mind control, this is where I started. I was working on snail brains and controlling their minds by feeding them different kinds of uh, juices. So if you gave a snail watermelon juice, it would respond by eating and if you give it Listerine, it'll start throwing up. And the what you see below there is the brain recording as the snail is being fed all of this. And the funny part is it's all in a disembodied brain. So there was no body attached to it. It was just the snail brain detached from the body with just the esophagus. And you can see the brain there that looks like a bikini top. And you would just 
flush some watermelon juice into the esophagus and it'll start responding by feeding signals and so on. And then I moved to uh, work with uh, zebrafish um, and looking at uh, engineering their brains so they would glow with specific neurons that controlled um, uh, hormone, hormonal release for sex hormones. And then you manipulate those neurons with different kinds of techniques and technology. And, and then at Columbia University, I was developing these chips that could uh, record from brains and as well as grow neurons on top of gold, um, gold-plated microchips and kind of create like an artificial retina is kind of what our objective was. And this technology has now what you're probably going to be seeing as Neuralink and things that Elon Musk is working on. So it's kind of a uh, something that came before that. And also creating biologically powered batteries uh, was another project I was working on. And then uh, since 2008, I've been collaborating with artists like Victoria Vesna on uh, different kinds of projects like the Hawk Zodiac project. Um, but more uh, importantly for this um, talk, uh, been del delving into the concept of neuroethics and trying to teach the concepts of neuroethics to undergraduate students so that as they are designing experiments, as they're de designing technology, they start to think about the ethics behind it. Should I be doing this? Is this, is this socially relevant? Is this um, important for society? So those kinds of questions uh, weaved into the design of experiments and technology as opposed to an afterthought, which is kind of where it is at right now. Um, and Marco mentioned the concept of um, uh, access to technology and um, the prosthetics. And some of the questions we've raised is uh, if there's a wheelchair which is allowing people to like, you know, uh, uh, be super mobile and enter into all kinds of different areas, who gets access to the wheelchair and who deserves the wheelchair is a big question. So even though these kinds of technologies exist, not everybody has access to it. Um, the other thing is neurodiversity. So we have a lot of questions about autism and um, different kinds of uh, people who are um, diverse. And uh, what's happening is, the doctors and the researchers have access to the almost the brains of these individuals and they use them as subjects, but they don't treat them as individuals. So the concept of thinking about ethics of um, humanizing some of these aspects of neurodiversity and um, different kinds of neural minds, I think is an important topic that, uh, that needs to be there. And I've been trying to delve into that by creating these public spaces of inquiry, of creating these almost speed dating scenarios where you bring in artists, scientists, social workers, patients, uh, to kind of talk about these uh, topics which are important from different stakeholder perspectives. So what is possible in terms of mind control? So we mentioned Neuralink, uh, which is this brain chip that's been implanted in the brain. And it's going to be con uh, it's going to be uh, controlled by Wi-Fi. And the minute that you can control it by Wi-Fi means that it can be hacked. So soon you're going to have people with chips in their brains that can be hacked. So uh, think about that a little bit. And then um, we also have snail spice. Uh, given that my love for snails is there, is I kind of want to uh, talk about these uh, snails which have these little video cameras installed in them and can run around your backyard taking pictures of you. Um, and then those pictures are then transmitted. And so wherever you go, they are either hearing you or taking pictures of you. So this is like an actual um, uh, project that was done. And um, this was restricted for a little while, but now it's back on again. So human brain organoids uh, have now been allowed to be implanted into rats. So you, soon you can start having rats with human brain cells in them. And so does that mean that these rats are human? Are they thinking like humans? Uh, should we, they be treated like humans? So these are all some of the ethical uh, questions that we need to start thinking about uh, going forward.
This is again uh, been possible in a few different ways. Uh, false memories implanted into sleeping mice. So uh, these mice were trained uh, where they were given um, almost associations for places. Um, and by just tr targeting certain parts of the brain when they were sleeping, and, and when they woke up and they went to those places, they would get all excited, even though they had never seen those places before. And so this is because they had false memories implanted in them. And the leap from mice to humans is not that big, that big anymore. So if this kind of technology is possible, um, then it's either already being worked on or it's only a very quick leap to start working on this in uh, with humans. And light switches, uh, which would turn memories on and off. So this is optogenetics. And while this particular mouse has a long electrode that's just implanted in it and it's coming out and that is the laser that's shining the lights on and off, what has now been possible is also just using nanoparticles in the brain and then turning them on and off with light. So you don't need this electrode sticking out of your head in order for you to have your mind control. You can just have nanoparticles injected and that would then basically with just shining either infrared light or having some kind of ultrasound, you might be able to turn them on and off, thereby controlling the brain. And uh, this was a fascinating article about how they network three different monkeys to kind of work together in conjunction to operate a video game. And even though the monkeys could not see each other, they quickly figured out that they had to work in coordination with these disembodied remote brains in order to get the treat that they wanted. So one monkey controlled the X joystick, one controlled the Y, and one controlled the Z, and they had to work in coordination. Again, they couldn't see each other, they didn't know there was another monkey, but they knew <laughs> there was another brain, and they had to work together to kind of achieve their target, and they managed to do it. So, and this was, this actually article is pretty, uh, about a couple of years old, so you can think about where they are now in terms of uh, their research. And this one is almost hot off the press. It's about um, ultrasound, which can read monkeys' brains. So they're able to find out what a monkey is going to do just by using the ultrasound to kind of figure out, predict what the next course of a monkey's action is. So um, that's something that's really interesting. So if, if it can be done with ultrasound on a monkey, that then can also be done with uh, with humans is kind of the next point here. And this is a, a, this is a flip side of it by recording brain activity of uh, someone looking at a, at a bird, you, the brain activity is actually telling you what is actually being visualized. So just by looking at activity, we'll be able to parse out what people are looking at. And um, this was alluded to right at the big. Uh, maybe uh, real, real will be talking about this next uh, when she's talking about neuromarketing. But uh, I've been researching a lot on neuro forecasting and how uh, crowd aggregate data predicts what trends are going to be. So, uh, if I present you with two choices, do you like song? Uh, do you think which song will be most popular in six months? Song A or song B? You might immediately say song A, but your brain waves, and more importantly, the brain waves of a, a huge crowd of people is actually saying song B is going to be the most popular. And if you wait for six months and find out which is the most popular song, the, your brain is actually predicting which song is going to be the most downloaded or which stock is going to be the most um, uh, uplifted or something like that. So the, almost they're looking at these crowd data to find out the forecast what's going to happen, what is the latest trend, and so on. And maybe that is going to be the most important neuromarketing uh, tool going forward, uh, getting a bunch of people with brain helmets on, trying to figure out what they're interested in or not. Uh, so a lot of this has worked into me in uh, diving into this concept of neuro tarot. I was fascinated by the tarot cards because uh, it people use them to... Uh, predict things or guess what their intuition and intellect uh, uh, in intuition is about. So I'm like, what is the neuroscience behind it? So I've kind of been diving deep a little bit into it. 
Um, and that's kind of led me into uh, concepts about what makes the brain predictive, um, what is neuroforecasting, um, and things like that. And those are all um, kind of my artistic practice has been diving into kind of creating a set of tarot cards based on neuroscience. And that's been a fun ride uh, for me for the last uh, couple of years, actually. And uh, that's it. Let's, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion soon. So. Said you never failed to surprise me. <laughs> so, it reminds me actually of a short conversation I had at one point um, with Mark Cohen, who I was collaborating with, and I asked him, do you think uh, they'll be able to read our thoughts? And he said, oh, we can do that already. <laughs> he said it so like matter-of-factly, and I thought, oh, what? <laughs> Anyway, we'll see. We'll see how all of that goes into the markets. It's definitely uh, interesting, I should say. So then, uh, to talk, to bring us back to Earth is Rea Klanchik, who is actually um, working with a startup company. She's a project manager. Uh, do you pronounce it Black B or it's? Uh, no, it's it's called Black Box. Black box, okay, because the, the logo is just BLCK. Um, and this is actually a spin-off, I understand, from the University of Slovenia, of Ljubljana. And you are, okay, great. And you actually are one of the first companies in Slovenia to, uh, or in, in the EU, I guess, to look specifically to applied neuroscience. Uh, from a com commerce point of view. So we're actually eager to see how you're working on this and how you're considering some of the issues that the artists bring up. The floor yeah, is yours. You. Welcome. That was a, thank you. That was a really great introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen right now. Hopefully my computer doesn't crash. Uh, let's go. Is it working? Perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. So my name is Raya Klanschik. I'm the project manager and neuroscience researcher. Is that better? Okay. Uh, I'm the project manager and neuroscience researcher at Black Box Applied Neuroscience. And if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, here's my link. Um, so I'm going to start off with my background mostly because I feel like even though this is a very diverse panel, I actually work with, you know, people who's working in neuromarketing and the way you go into neuroscience, there's kind of a set path there. And it's something that I want to broaden and I want to, you know, expand and let people know that actually you don't have to be, you know, this sort of person to actually end up in neuroscience in the commercial field. So my start in neuroscience really started with volunteer work in high school with an organization called Epilepica C. Um, and we were developing technological solutions for people with epilepsy. Um, it was really rewarding work at the time. Um, I was also in high school, so it was, a, you know, it was a whole new thing that I got to be a part of. But um, what really started, you know, what the question that really stuck with me is like, what is the brain? What is the mind? Um, especially when you look at epileptic seizures, there's so many um, things that can cause an epileptic seizure and so many reasons why somebody has this condition. But the way that consciousness comes back, the way that it reboots um, is so poetic almost, and it's so similar. And it really gives you this image inside the brain as a self-organizing system. Um, and that's kind of where my whole like fascination with actual specific brain science came in. Though I have to say that I think science fiction really opened the field to a lot of people, and for me especially. And kind of that explains where my next step in my journey went. Um, I decided, oh, my computer's frozen. Oh, that's not good. Great. Uh, will it work? I'm sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. 
yeah i just i yeah what is going on you're back you're back you're back i know sorry okay uh yeah i moved to basically i moved to dublin um because i went to film school at one point um and got really interested in, in a lot of debates with my colleagues in film school about like what is film language and how are we able to understand it and can a computer understand film language um and this is the point where i would like you to show the video uh please because basically what we decided to do was what if we could develop AI contextual tools that could understand trailers and that could understand advertising. And how could we make the computer get, you know, get what we were seeing and why we love these movies and what was going on. Um, and so I was going to show a video now of basically one of our experiments with the Matrix 2 trailer, um, if that's possible. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in my head at the time, I didn't know that this was maybe neuroscience. You know, I was more like, I, I just love action films. I love science fiction. And what if we could put, you know, what we're learning in computer science and AI to apply to those areas? Obviously, that has really moved on and there's a lot that we can do. And we've already mentioned in this panel um, already some stuff that's going on in that space. But that's kind of where I was going. Um, and yeah, that's pretty, pretty much, you can see object detection on a video trailer here. Uh, what happened was the Corona basically shut down Dublin and shut down our project as well. So I moved back to Slovenia and I started looking at, you know, what, how could I kind of go with this that I was interested in trailers, you know, advertising, how do we understand this film language that's being shown there? Um, and Black Box Applied Neuroscience actually contacted me because um, we can stop the film now and I can continue my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we, come on. With Black Box, they, had, uh, they also had to stop their neuromarketing measurements because of Corona. Basically, it wasn't, it wasn't ethical to continue doing that. So we, started looking at historical data. We had seven years worth of neuromarketing data. Um, and what we mean by that is we had EG recordings of people watching advertisements. We also had eye tracking uh, done on them. And we had this huge, huge data sets just standing there. <laughs> um, and I came in with my knowledge of, you know, film trailers of what we've done in film school and from Picasso Analytics of object detection. Um, and we started building models and we started experimenting and we started being a little bit creative um, because it was Corona. We were all remote working um, and we, we, we pushed some boundaries and we ended up submitting the project to Falling Walls Berlin Science Week uh, 2020 just to really get feedback <laughs> from the science community and to kind of share the project and share the research um, and get more inputs on where to go next. And we actually ended up being finalists for the science breakthrough of the year, among other people, obviously, but it was it was a great acknowledgement of the project and it's something that I wanna continue doing um, in the future. And basically, this is what neuromarketing looks like to kind of demystify it a little bit. Um, she's actually looking at a recording of already processed data, but uh, it looks like this. You're sitting in a laboratory. They have an EEG on you, which is this hat. They have an eye tracking camera or glasses, and you're looking at something. And then we, uh, and then we um, basically analyze the data. And this data is is quite messy to analyze if I have to say so there's there's this assumption of people that say oh it's just automatic if you have the right technology and you put it on somebody's head you can just control them and I, I from working and from getting these questions I would like to emphasize it's neuroscience is hard <laughs> and it's not that simple and you usually don't get direct vision into somebody's head you you really have to know what you're looking at you really have to know how to use the tools um, and you really have to understand that process um, but to conclude, this was the falling walls. And what I've learned from working in this area and what I think is the most important, especially in this 
topic that we're talking about today, which is about control, um, is the fact that there is definitely a lack of diversity in neuroscience. Um, and there's kind of almost, there's so many barriers to entry into this field that really stop inclusion and conversation and discussion. Um, and that's something that I think we really need to focus on in the future because as so many topics, as my colleagues already mentioned, there's a lot going on. Um, there's a lot of potential for disaster as well, but there's also so much potential for good. And if we just work together and if we start really thinking about being inclusive and having more diversity in this field, um, I think we can really achieve great things. Thank you. Thank you. What a nice way to round up all the different presentations and to think of all the different points of view. And I actually like that the last slide that was left was diversity in neuroscience. I think it could be the jumping off point that we should talk about because uh, there's so many questions and um, if we can just try to focus it on the idea of diversity uh, networking also, the fact that we're all talking from so many different locations and have been for the past year and a half now. How is that changing our collective brain? How are we in personal modes getting into um, these very privileged environments and uh, the gap and this, you know, biological issues? And uh, that's why I like uh, that both Marco and Siddharth brought up, we're animals and we're disconnected from the larger ecologies. And all of this actually takes up a lot of energy. Uh, so what are your thoughts on some of that? Let's start with Christina. You're muted. Yes, I think I pressed multiple times, but that was it. <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated by, by this project that creates this, this encounters between people and the, the intimate quality of these relations that happen in, in an art space versus a, a lab space. And I, I think, you know, this, this is creates a possibility for opening towards otherness and enabling us to, to navigate differences and understand the, the limits of our own subjecthood in, in that process. Um, and I think, you know, that, that physical proximity adds to the, the visceral quality of that encounter, and this is something that we might miss in the online sphere, even though we, we may feel connected, even at a distance. But those differences become apparent in a different way in, in actual space. I think, you know, this is what uh, fascinates me about this this project uh, that I'm looking at and the social dimension of them. Um, so those, those are some of my initial thoughts. And I think, you know, like with many of this project is this um, coupling of people who are, who do not know each other, who are complete strangers and come together for a very brief period of time, which may be like 15 to 20 minutes interaction while they're, neural frequencies are, are being measured and it really brings into picture the, the ethereal quality of the singularity of the individual as well as this ongoing variability of exchanges with others. Sorry, I didn't... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Masha. Uh, I was wondering how you feel about the neuromarketing in relation to robots and androids in particular, that some fear will take over the role of actors or even professors in the future, and uh, the AI will determine what we learn. And, you know, there's a lot of dark scenarios there. But you've been always looking on the light side with it and you're in love with robots. So I'm curious what your point of view is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, there is always a dark side of it. And whenever I'm lecturing about Android science and also about uh, neurotechnologies, of course, I point out also the dark side of it. 
But then I showed the, the, the positive, you know, the empowerment of the hu human with it. And the thing is also that we will not avoid this. Technology will advance, you know, if you want or not, you know. But it just depends on us how we're going to use it and how we show it, how we demonstrate those tools to the youth. So I think we have to start here. And um, and I hear an echo. And I think also, actually, the quite big role is of us artists here, you know, bring, bringing scientific advancements, you know, to the broader audience and also that they lose fear. This is, for example, what happened in, in my experiences when we are presenting neurotechnologies, BCI. People don't even know that this actually exists or if they know they are afraid of it, you know, they have really fear and they, they have this negative uh, approach to it. But when we demonstrate it, you know, they really lose fear and when they see that these things actually work, you know, I. I so impressed and really want to know more. And that's how we start conversation about neuroscience, you know, also in general audiences. Same with the, with the robots. Whenever I'm demonstrating, when I'm showing the, the, my research about Android science, it's like, it's a shock for, for most of the people, but not negative shock, you know, they, because they were not aware that such science actually exists, you know, that such robots, Android science actually exist and that such experiments are happening. They, the, the broader audience is not aware of it. They think it's only in science fiction movies, you know, but we need to talk about it because I'm not mm -hmm. saying it's coming, you know, it's already here. In Japan, you know, Androids are already living among people. So it's it's nothing so, so new, you know, for, for them. But it's just the way how we, we, we present it. And I'm also saying that robots will never, you know, like uh, substitute humans, for sure not. This is also what I learned when we did experiments, when I had to learn how to operate the robot and how the robot is made, you know. I can see, I'm even more and more amazed how our body is made, you know, that we are far, far away from it. Even if yeah, we are super impressed by the Boston Dynamics robots, but we show it for they show it for a few seconds, you know, but they don't show all the thing that is behind. Right, right. <laughs> it's actually pretty primitive in some ways, but it's moving yeah. pretty quick. Although yeah. it always amazes me how much trust we put into machines that are about a hundred years old, and we we have millions of years of work on our bodies and minds, so it's funny. Mm -hmm. So Dart, you're on the other side of that spectrum. I'm actually curious what your thoughts are recently about diversity and consumerism in relation to neuroscience and marketing. Yeah, diversity is something I've been thinking about a lot, um, okay. mainly because we've been developing more and more technologies and given that very few people are developing these technologies, they're not incorporating all the different perspectives that they should have. Uh, and now it's becoming more evident that people um, have big differences in their brains on how they are brought up. There are sociocultural differences in what people notice and how they react to situations, even socioeconomic differences in how people differ, react to situations. Uh, for example, um, if you, if I show a, if, even with this Zoom screen, if you ask different people from different cultures what they notice, say, okay, you see a picture, go back and write down all the things you notice. People who are trained in different cultures are going to notice different things, and unless we bring that multiple perspectives into developing these new technologies we are going to lose out and it's going to be catered towards like a very small niche group of people. And we're already seeing that Google um, put out those images where it is not able to recognize African-American faces. Microsoft launched a chatbot, which was racist. And, you know, all kinds of like crazy things are happening. And um, or what is the typical picture of a scientist and always a man's image crops up and not a woman's Im image. So all these kinds of uh, things are ingrained 
all the biases that humans have are becoming ingrained in these technologies and we, we just have to break it apart. I, I'd like to add something. I know, I've, you know there's two things I'd like to say. First of all, in relationship to your last comment, um, there's a lot of interesting uh, data coming out that not only, I mean, this idea of, you know, um, facial recognition being, um, being, uh, you know, more attuned to Caucasian faces than uh, African American faces. But there's also a lot of people who say that this is really an advantage because we're getting to a situation of such extreme surveillance that in a way, African Americans have an advantage because they cannot be surveyed as adequately as white humans. So that's the first statement I thought would be interesting to throw out there. The idea of an advantage for not being, not being part of this algorithm or not being uh, read al as well algorithmic. It's a, it's a safety, it's a, play, it's a safe zone. The other thing I wanted to make a point we're talking, you know, I, I read that um, Shoshana Zuboff uh, quote about the big uh, But let's take for example the fact that with brain computer interfaces, we're already at the point where people can learn to, um, uh, you know, use their brain waves as an alpha wave or whatever. And uh, they can, they can, you know, they can move a cursor on the screen to move their wheelchair, they can move a cursor on the screen to operate a uh, robotic arm. The first thing I'd like to say about brain computer interfaces is that in the future, and so now we're using new waves and there are certain waves that are better for this than others. In the future, I believe there'll be maybe 10 or 15 types of brain wave patterns and each one will have different specificities, significances and, and qualities that make them better for certain uses than others. That's the first thing. Second thing is the fact that you can do this. We know that in 20 years or 10 years, the opposite is going to be able to be true. So now we're generating brain waves that can maneuver external prostheses and various other kinds of apparatuses. But in time, the opposite will be true. Those kinds of codes, the way that those brain waves are coded is going to be more and more specific and more and more exact. And then we have the opposite. The opposite being that brain waves will be generated by maybe a, a for instance, um, a machinic neural entity based on the connectome. Let's say it's a synthetic connectome. For all those who don't know what a connectome is, it's the uh, the array of connections in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a material human brain. But now we're working on synthetic connectomes, and these synthetic connectomes could be a form of situated consciousness, could be a situated external to the brain, and could be machinically operated and machines that teach other machines so that human beings are not even part of the conversation because we're no longer coding them. And they're, I'm just, this is a sci-fi, paranoid, delusional kind of, uh, kind of rave, rave. Rag, rag here, rage, whatever I'm saying, but it's true. This stuff will happen. So corporations, they're making tremendous amounts of money and they will find ways of more and more adaptations. So what could happen is that we move. So, so all of a sudden we're talking about neuromarketing. Well, yeah, neuromarketing, EEGs suck. EEGs are really crappy technology, but in the future, with brain computer interfaces doing more and more and more and more kinds of technologies that, which are going to be operated from brain computer uh, technology, because it's going to go crazy, brain computer technology, because you have to think about brain computer technologies like, like different kinds of media. So you have the camera obscura, the camera lucida, you have the, the first photograph, then you have the phenokiniscus scope, the zoetrope, then you have the cinematic film, then you have the, 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 the video camera, then you have the video camera that's now mo you can move around with, then you have virtual reality. You, brain computer interfaces is going to be another kind of media. We're not gonna be watching movies anymore. We're going to be involved in brain computer interface immersive techno technological conditions. So you have to think about it as another form of media and it's going to be everywhere. 
It's going to be everywhere. Everyone is going to be. It's going to be like your iPhone. You have your iPhone. Now we're talking about technology, virtuality, staying at home, the pan, post-pandemic condition, which is more and more digital. Now go to a restaurant we have an iPhone to even be able to read a QR code to see a menu. You know, this is what digitality is all about. Soon that will be part of and computer interface uh, systematics, okay? So just to finish, we're, we, we know that in Fordism, we had something called, we had something called formal subsumption. In other words, the, uh, the footprint uh, in uh, the bio, uh, you know, the, the, um, um, the bio, um, shit, anyway, the um, Foucault, the bio, uh, whatever, the power over the body, the biopolitics of the, of the uh, footplate of the industrial shed in which the worker was formerly subsumed working at the, uh, you know, in the analog, you know, uh, in, the, in an analog way along the assembly line was formerly subsumed, he clocked in and clocked out, then with uh, the movement into the society of control from the, um, you know, from we moved into this kind of technology where uh, control was everywhere, and we were what's called real subsumption, where everything in our life is is control and, and work and labor. And now we're moving into neural subsumption, where all our because in the future, this science fiction theory that I have out here, there, when you have the advancement of these, uh, uh, these brain computer interfaces into the point of where they are everywhere you are going to have what's called neural subsumption in which all our thoughts, conscious and unconscious, will be able to be made into work. You're not going to be working, at, you know, and Google knows all of this. They, they all know this. I mean, this is not a secret. Uh, your Google, Facebook uh, is already has a system of uh, translation that is five times faster than the ones we have now. They're already thinking about brain computer interfaces. So uh, it's all about bandwidth. <laughs> so uh, it's, I'm going to stop there. But that's where we're at. And um, you know, I'd be very careful um, to underestimate uh, the power of uh, neural, neural economics and neural consumerism. I really uh, think seriously about it because um, I really believe that in the future uh, you know, we're going to have neural, we're going to have the neural subsumption in neural capitalism. <clears throat> Marco, do you have any <laughs> comments on that? <laughs> a response from Marco. Yeah, well, more than a response, just adding some thoughts. And um, yeah, I, I, I can see the point that Warren is making. It, I'm not so sure as Warren that it, it will definitely happen, especially thinking that in 30, 50 years, we gonna be without food on our tables, in, even in Western countries. So that's always to be considered. Uh, but then, yeah, you made it, I mean, the risk is always there, and in that I agree totally with you. With, as with that, but also with robotic technology, the same. I was actually pretty surprised myself that that with robotics, for instance, and with some some wearable project as well, there has been quite strong backlash uh, from people, the general public, and ac that actually helped sinking projects. Now, if you think like the Google Glasses or whatever yeah. they were called, uh, there was an example that when when it went out, and I said, "Oh God, now we are completely ruined for the rest of our life." And actually, that thing didn't happen, and that was a good thing. And if you see also, I don't know, all the project of the Boston Dynamics, uh, I think maybe Masha mentioned earlier, uh, they they spend so much money making these amazing videos where, as Marshall properly said, they they just hidden, they are hiding most of the of what make their robot working. And every time they tried to put it on the market, nobody wanted it. Um, like the military, they tried the first big dog a couple of times while uh, Boston Dynamics was under Google because Google owned Boston Dynamics. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> then just like, Google just resold the company after the army refused to actually use the big dog in, in, in their military operation because it was too noisy. It would give away the position of their soldier. 
And also recently they were trying to sell it to the police in New York and they got it on the street for a couple of days and then there was so much backlash that they just took it out again. So these are just some examples and don't take me wrong, I'm quite a pessimistic guy. <laughs> so uh, I, I tend to be pretty, pretty pessimistic about this stuff. But these are small examples that at least they show how there is still an agency that, that people, citizens can exert. And maybe here we, we go back to, uh, to other themes that, that were shared earlier, also how important it is to disseminate science in an in a, in a understandable and horizontal way so that people can understand. And that is becoming increasingly difficult because of the type of society we live in, where it's all social media cycle hype, everything is mega famous for two days, and then the next thing coming in, you know. And in this sense, I think it's it's even more important to do proper science dissemination, showing showing the positive side, the bad side, and, and, and also the actual practical implementation of this kind of technology before it's too late, you know, before actual implementation. And speaking of dogs, you know, when there's a real disaster, the real dogs come out. <laughs> They're much more efficient than any robot ever. And uh, Siddharth will vouch for that because we did a whole project on dogs and smell. And it really also begs the question of interspecies uh, communication as well and how we've uh, put more precedence to communicating with machines and less with um, creatures around us and with the species, all species just disappearing at such a fast space. I mean, it's, it's mind boggling. I even lose the numbers because it keeps going up. Um, it's, it's such an important thing to not lose sight of a different type of consciousness that um, is free, available, but that doesn't really need anything, uh, and where we can share brain waves and control our own mind, but also the mind of others. And we've seen that with many leaders in a good or bad way. Um, so all of it, like Marco says, being so amplified and cut up into little pieces makes so, for so much confusion that it's really hard to tell what's what. And these kind of discussions and meetings and, and artworks and science research uh, projects are just so important, like Masha said, just to put it out there so people know it's there, first of all, and then there can be a discussion to take it further because the hopeful note is you know, the internet was not invented for this or for people to even talk to each other. The internet was invented, ARPANET, to, you know, save us from uh, the atom bomb and keep our stuff. And, and they would have never in a million years thought of what happened, right? So I think a similar thing may happen with brain technologies where we think it's for this and we have dark visions of that. But it may turn into a completely different thing that we could also utilize. It's not necessarily all dark, but the dark side is very much there because we don't see it. We don't, as a public, it's just kind of not there. So um, we have just we, a little time to close have to it off. We have to wear awareness. Have, that's all. Awareness, yes. Because, of course, you know, there's I agree. so many positive things, but in kind of in America, if you say, you know, like Jonathan Crary's book 24 seven, he says it like, even if you make any comment against technology, you're considered not, not a team player or something, you know, you're considered, you know, there's no even, there's no even discussion contra, you know, and I think there's some real, I think we should slow it up a little bit. I, I, I'm not into yes. the acceleration yes. situation. I, I think agree. we should slow it up. So I, I totally think agree. It's important to remember that all this technology is also making us more aware of our bodily interfaces and how we may be able to, to regulate them. And I think it's, it's a matter of visibility, as you're all saying, right? I, it's a matter of access as well. And this is what new media art is very often doing, is making these tools available and 
creating new purposes of them while giving people an understanding of how they work and what are the processes that are at play so that we do not fictionalize that much uh, what, what science is and understand both its potential and its, its limitations. And I think what, what's fascinating about you know, this, all these queries is, is how we maintain this, this consciousness and how can we maintain that switch between the, the interior and, and the exterior without losing track of all these various parameters, both biological and technological, that, that are working together with each other to, to get back to... Um, to that idea of the ecology of all this, the systems and how they can easily get, get out of, of balance if we lose consciousness of how they work. Siddharth? Yeah, I agree with uh, Warren's point that I think that it is, we are heading towards a way where neuro, uh, neuro computing and neuro computer interfaces are going to be predominant. I think think that um, I, I, I do understand what Marco was saying about the big dog and but I feel like the robotics is going to go into a different trajectory of soft robotics and not mimicking um, you know what we already have not biomimicry kind of robotics but kind of a different trend in robotics is going to emerge as opposed mm -hmm. to trying to replicate animal or human humanistic uh, aspects because uh, the more uh, human like a robot becomes the more scared people get of it the whole uncanny valley aspect of it where uh, the more and more humanoid a robot becomes people get a little bit more uh, unsure about what to do with it it's kind of emerging as well so but i do agree that the uh, combination of you know grow having biological entities in, incorporated into robots and kind of things those are those are going to emerge from it i did want to push back a little against uh, what warren said about um uh, protecting African Americans from surveillance technology, it feels like coming from a privileged perspective. For example, when I go and put my hand under a toilet, uh, under a paper dispenser, it won't recognize my skin color, so I won't get the paper out. So when more and more of these technologies are being used in real life situations, say when you want to use a face recognition for a boarding pass or something like that, and if it's not able to recognize people of different skin tones, or when I go in my car, my car won't recognize my accent. It won't respond to me. And it, it, it debilitates like real life daily actions. And for that reason, I think that diversity thing really is important. Um, yes, I do understand the surveillance point of view, but I feel that's more of a, a way to dismiss concerns of people going through everyday life. And Rhea, how is your company looking at some of these issues, the the fears and the dark side of the... Yeah, we confront it a lot with when we're measuring participants. Um, our, particip our participants are volunteers and they, you know, get rewarded for helping us and for being part of the research. Um, and most of them do come from a curiosity point of view, you know, they... they they heard somewhere from a friend or they saw that um, we posted that, you know, we're going to have these measurements and you can get your brain measured. And they come to us and there's this excitement, fear, you know, unsure, but also, oh my God, I'm, I'm stepping into the future when I'm doing this. And for us who, you know, done this and who are used to this technology, you know, when you're confronted with this, it makes you step back a little bit and appreciate it a little bit more you know what we're doing and where humanity came to that we're able to really talk about this discussion in a real sense these quite you know these problems and issues that we've been discussing right now as a group you know the fact that humanity came to this point that we're even talking about this this technology and what it can do and where we can go and what cliff we can jump off of now that we've created the opportunity um I think it's just, that's really the part of the work that makes it rewarding. Um, it is scary though, I do have to agree. When you really start thinking about this stuff, it, it is scary and especially why I wanted to say diversity, I know we have to wrap up, but why I wanted to say uh, diversity, it's because, you know, there, there's so much more to discuss and there's such a bigger discussion to be had with everybody. And who 
you know, when we're collecting this data, it's also who is looking at this data, who's creating the tools that look at this data, who's creating the applications for this data. It, all of it is so limited. <laughs> even, you know, I come from a place of privilege, but I even felt, you know, I was the only woman in the room <laughs> a lot of the times. And from working in Black Box, I've been able to push to get, you know, at least equal gender groups when we're working on this stuff. So that we at least have yes. that. Um, At least, but much, 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 much more. We want so intergenerational. We want animals yeah. in the room. We want to be aware of the bacteria. And we want to also be aware of the amazing possibility of doing this, where we have two people from Slovenia, one person in Kentucky, one person in Seattle, two people in Berlin. I'm here in Los Angeles. And I just want you to just, with the audience, wherever you are, to just for a second think how amazing it is that we can connect and talk about this and put these thoughts out. And like Warren said, it's just the beginning of a discussion. I can see, Warren, why you created a whole school around this. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Jiva, for being behind the scenes and make this happen. Bye, everybody. just wanted to say... Hands to the, okay. the stream. I wanted to say that uh, Nora Khan, Nora Khan is the woman who, who wrote about this uh, positive effect of, of survey of, of, of you know, yes. African Americans not being able to. Her name is Nora Shout Khan. Shout out to Nora. And she's at You know her at all? Do you know her? I know uh, of her, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's cool. Thank Here, you. Here's her. So I guess we're off the air, Jiva. Okay. Thank you, Victoria, Masha, Marco, Sidart, Cristina, and Rea for being our guests today. With great pleasure, I also announce upcoming Kiblix 2021 group exhibition at Kibla Portal, where we will gradually introduce cutting edge projects by international artists starting at the end of June with video and VR installation by Jakob Kutsk Stinson, participatory project in augmented reality by Studio Untold Garden and Sebastian Dahlquist, VR landscape by Tanja Vujinovic, intermedia installation by Nika Ariavets, and generative audiovisual painting by Tadej Droltz, and more and more international artists working on the crossroads of art, technology, virtual and augmented reality. For more past and future program of Kiblix 2021, follow us on kiblix.org and social media. Thank you, take care, and good night.